Gross. You. Those friggin' pointy dagger teeth. You can tell that it's actually just a camera that's recording in slow motion that's spinning around them at like 40 miles an hour. Creature work is always something that kind of intimidates me because there's so many facets that go into it. Dude, Resident Evil took a page from their playbook. How do you think they did this? Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video. Stick around so you can find out how to get 15% off your next Raycon purchase. Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting and spooky episode of Visual Effects Artists React. It's our special Halloween episode. It's the one time of the year that we look at horror films. Normally when we react, it's excitement or joy or humor, but today it'll be scary reactions, fear. Like this, like this, like. Dude, cue the shot from anime fidget spinners. Well, that was anger. That was <laughs> okay, anger, not okay, fear. Okay, fair. <laughs> Tuck in your kids, don't let your parents see, turn on all the lights in the house, and let's jump right in. The House of the Dead. So this is directed by the infamous Yubol. <gasps> Uwe. Uwe Bola. Uwe, Uwe. I always thought he was Uwe Bol. And this is shortly after The Matrix came out. So there's just footage of the game, I guess, in here for some reason. You know, I kind of admire that, honestly. It's really distracting and janky, but who cares? But I love these like poor man's like bullet time rigs. Poor man's bullet time. This is really it. <laughs> if you watch that too, you can tell that it's actually just a camera that's recording in slow motion that's spinning around them at like 40 miles an hour. Except for this shot. Hey, I'm <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my god, I love it's like, it. It's like boom, and then they move like three inches. All these slow motion shots feel like they're like, all right, get in there, action. All right, you're right, you're good. Get out of here. Go, 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 move. Next person. <laughs> oh, does it flip? He flips. Why did the zombie flip? Why did he throw the axe? And why did he have an why axe? Did she jump? Is he really a zombie? Oh, there's a little bit of matrix. Oh, more matrix. What's going on? Oh, that's how shotguns work. Oh, they're bees. <laughs> not the bees! The bullet time effects, I wouldn't even call that a visual effect. Yeah, it's not all special effects because using specialized camera rigs. That's a VFX shot. The axe was yeah. comped in there probably because they didn't really throw an axe that fast at her. Wait, was that was that just an amputee or was that like a... That looks like, no, that's a visual effect. It is. You can tell the, the feathered edge on his legs, which don't quite stay in the same spot. They move a little <laughs> bit. This is how Sam and I did visual effects at the same time. Like, that's basically a shot that I did. Yeah, in 2003. This movie inspired us because it let us know as aspiring filmmakers that we were making stuff just as good as what you saw on the big screen. <laughs> you guys ever seen Cube? Oh yeah, Cube's great. Cube's a really good example of a one location film that's really high concept and makes it feel like it's not a one location film. This is a seriously good and creative movie. I was so blown away when I saw this. What happened? Oh snap. What the heck? Dude, Resident Evil took a, <laughs> a, a page from their playbook. <laughs> I love that effect. How do you think they did this? That's a prosthetic. That's not a real person there. Yeah? Yeah, look at his eyes. I find myself agreeing with Sam on this because the next shot is that same prosthetic. The fingers are crazy. It looks like they move. Yeah, having them move like an inch before they collapse. Oh my God, it's so brutal. It's a really flawless effect. I have a theory that the audience likes anticipation more than the payoff. I like guess the part that makes us sit on the edge of our seat and go like, oh, what happened? And they just hold this shot. And they have this shot here, the blood seeps onto his shirt, and then it's seeping down his face. Then finally, boom, I feel like the hand shot is the first payoff shot. And this and this are the second and third payoff shots. And the payoff shots are cool, but without that anticipation, all that style, the chunking shots wouldn't really hit quite nearly as hard as they do. Curiosity is a super powerful thing for human beings. Like, you can really hook them in with that. Do you guys want to see a really gross, gnarly scene? Yeah. You? I mean, sure, but it's only going to be on quarterdigital.com. Yeah. I mean, listen, we've got extended episodes on the website, so check it out if you want to see this gruesome shot. Guys, let's take a look at it. At, at what? It. What's it? it? Oh, 
like literally it. Literally. <laughs> IT. IT. <laughs> the clown movie. This one's for you, Ren. I'm sorry. Oh, why? I, I missed. I didn't read it. Have you seen chapter two? I've not seen the second one yet. Okay, have fun. What's in this fridge? Oh, it's a body. Ooh. Okay, that's, that's kind of creepy. Ah! That's awesome. Rolling head. It's really solid visual effects so far. Yeah. Like, is that whole shot CG? I feel like it's probably a hole in the floor and he's sticking his head through it. Yeah. It looks like a, a hole in the floor kind of gag to me. Yeah. That's real hair right there. That does look real. That's real hair. It's dirty, matted, dusty yeah. hair, which is its own thing. You know, like we watched Godzilla versus Kong, you know, they're like, look, we made like wet hair for him. We made the dry hair version. We made the semi, like you can make all that stuff, but like that kind of look I've never seen before. Yeah. You don't end up with like eight different styles of hair physics in one like sim. You don't end up with like sweat and then like fuzz and then curls and then straight and then strands and then fluff. Like you don't get- I mean, you so can. Yeah, it can be kinda to a certain to a certain level of interactivity in physics. You can't. Uh oh. Ooh. Little hands on the end. The heck? <laughs> it's got literal hands for hands. The tiny hands. It's a very creepy touch. Is it gonna be a spider? <laughs> <laughs> But isn't this all fake in their imagination and stuff? Like, why are they afraid? Oh God, it got him. <laughs> it did get him. It got him. Gross. Ew. Those freaking pointy dagger teeth. The very ineffective spider monster. <laughs> you done teed me over the head. <laughs> He's like, don't stab my hands, please. Don't stab my hands. Don't stab my hands, Hulk. Thanks. That is some incredible CG work. There wasn't a single shot there that took me out of it. It almost makes me wonder if the whole scene is CG. And it's entirely possible that these backgrounds are photography plates, but boy, are they making it difficult for themselves to have to then deal with all the shadows and interactions from those flashlights. There comes a point when it actually does become more simple to just make the entire thing CG. I can't help but feel like all the close-ups or all we see is the ground. It's easier just to get a unified image with all of the baked in lighting from everything affecting itself. So is that a full CG shot? See, that shot right there looks pretty real to me. Like, look at all the cobwebs. But isn't it funny how we point to cobwebs and we say, there's no way that could be fake. No, I'm, I'm not saying it's no way. I'm just saying it's like, it's pretty nicely detailed. The thing is like, when something's 100% CG, it all has to be placed by hand. So meaning everything ends up with intention. And I don't see anything that's like not intentional. Everything feels pretty intentional. The cobwebs are intentional. The rafters feel intentional. The textures feel intentional. You know, there's nothing that's just like, a, oops, we accidentally filmed that too. Yeah, but it could be CG. <laughs> Dude, look at the way the little hands like touch the flakes in the ground, which is just further indication that they have a CG floor. I mean, that has to be a CG floor. At first I thought, oh, that could be like a little puppet thing, but then like it started articulating in a way that I'm fairly certain is CG. That automatically tells me that the caliber of CG that they have in this scene alone is already high enough that it's making me question what else is not real either. You wanna see some more nuts visual effects? Back to the same kitchen from the first movie. Wait, that's the same fridge. Yeah. This is such a cool effect. Looks so good. That looked like a contortionist, dude. With like a head replacement. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fully CG body with a real head. When his last arm goes over, that's the full body reveal. That's my guess. You pretty much nailed it, Ren. So when he comes Hell out of the yeah. fridge, and he's coming out of the fridge for real, his head was not upside down actually, I believe it was to the side. And so they've just taken that footage, just rotated it even further and just kind of relit it by hand. But once he kind of like starts to turn, then it becomes real. And they took out his entire body and the body is CG. And you can kind of tell if you go to the very next shot and when he's all real, there is a bit of like a distinct difference. Everything's just like a little crisper. It's, and a it little is crisper, more yeah. wrinkly and a little more detailed, you know? Sometimes it's easier to not have to transition to the real thing because now you're pointing out this is when it's real, even if you only subconsciously see it rather than notice it. Time to float. 
So in order to make this Halloween episode a little extra special, we reached out to Weta Digital to see if they wanted to partake. And they actually hooked us up with a man named Sheldon Stopsack, who was the visual effects supervisor in The Tomorrow War. And he wants to talk about how they made the monsters. Dude, the creature work in The Tomorrow War is actually pretty great. Have you guys seen this movie? I have seen this movie. I watched the entire movie. Oh, I have not. I'm curious. Oh, scary. Spooky hole. Boom. Whoa! <laughs> that was perfectly timed. <laughs> so this is the queen white spike, you know, like any sort of colony of aliens. You always gotta have a queen. These are aliens? Yeah. They are aliens. The animation's really nice. The creature actually reminds me a lot of that one creature from Love, Death, and Robots. Remember that, like, dog fighting scene, but with, like, alien avatars? Yeah, where it looks like the less shapeshiftery version of the creatures from Edge of Tomorrow. Creature work is always something that kind of intimidates me because there's so many facets that go into it from the incredibly detailed model work and the texturing and then of course all the animation and then the rendering. With creatures like this, you gotta nail that like specular highlight stuff. It's what makes something look slimy. Spooky. My face looks like a skull. It does. <laughs> it looks like a skull. All right, I wanna see this shot. Do you guys feel like this shot is rough. It's coming up here. Oh, yeah, that's a little wacky. Ooh. So what about that shot looks rough to you? I think the face of the very challenging situation here, which is real footage of Chris Pratt diving in, and then a fully CG alien, and they have one camera move for the alien, which is super dynamic, it's pulling back, it's, you know, the thing's galloping. It looks like it's, it's like running at 20, 25 miles an hour, yeah. or something like that. And Chris Pratt's lingering in the air as the camera is moving that speed, implying that he's, he launched himself at about 25, faster. He's actually going faster than, so he's going <laughs> at 30. He's flying at 30 miles an hour. Now that you mentioned it. He's catching up to the creature, and that, <laughs> is why it looks weird. It is a bit of a two-dimensional, three-dimensional issue also in the sense that Chris Pratt, when he's filmed, becomes basically a, a cutout. And then you have a full 3D model and you're trying to marry the two. Doesn't the monster shrink a little too in this one shot? It's like smaller than yeah. a little? Like in the big fight, it's a good like three or four heads above him. And then when he jumps onto it, it's basically his size. But that stuff happens in movies all the time and we usually don't notice it. These are all subconscious things, but when you stack too many subconscious things on, it starts to feel a little weird. <laughs> That looks great. Yeah. Whoa! Yeah. Okay. The alien melting looks awesome. Melting. It's like, Bleh! They get away with it because all the rest of the shots look really good. Like, their dynamics are great. There's this concept of secondary motion. You know, it's the same thing like in that shot with the full CG characters in Lord of the Rings running across the bridge and they look photoreal because they got the secondary motion of all their capes and fabric right, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, the secondary motion of all like the blood and the goop and the snow and the technicals, that all really goes a long way towards selling these creatures and making them feel really complicated and dynamic. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Howdy. So what was your responsibility on the Tomorrow War? I was the visual effects supervisor for Weta Digital. And what was nice about the Tomorrow War is that uh, it's been a show where we got engaged pretty early. You know, really more in the pre-production phase where you just have a lot of fun just exploring things. Weta was sort of a lead facility and we were lucky enough to take the lead on a lot of creative aspects, including on the creation of the White Spikes. The White Spikes are very, very complicated in their motion, or at least they visually appear complicated. You know, they have tentacles that are flailing everywhere, their heads are moving all over the place, their spits flying everywhere. How do you make that complicated motion for a creature? That's a good question. That's where probably the challenge really kicked in with the White Spike in many ways. The animation work obviously was such a broad range from like individual like hero moments where you just have the female on their own. But then you have also, you know, the other end of the spectrum where you have like, you know, thousands of them. And you kind of have to find a little bit of middle ground. Like how much can you actually keyframe there and animate them? And how much do you, you know, let eventually do like a sort of massive crowd simulation do? And then also had the sort of middle ground basically where our motion edit team kicked in and they utilize basically like tons of loops and cycles that we basically created that so allowed us to respond well at scale. You know, when you have like hundreds of them and you want them to be more intricate than you would normally get from a crowd simulation. When we watch big budget action movies these days, it almost starts to feel like visual effects just become like unlimited. We've seen character animation, we've seen complex renders, we've seen photorealistic lighting. But if you had to kind of find an area that you felt we were still facing technological limitations in when doing effects like this, what would it have to be? 
I mean, don't get me wrong, there's always technical limitations and we ran into them just as much, but it was more of a question, can we do better here? You know, in Visual Effects, we're at the point right now, in particular with creature work, where, you know, we push the boundary in the envelope pretty far. It's like, you know, there, there, there are very, very few limits left. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's not to say that, you know, the, the, the quest doesn't really go further. Again, especially Weta, it's such a technological driven company where, you know, you look always at, at the, the boundaries to be pushed further and the nuances. And it can be very specific topics and subjects and, you know, intricate things that you may not really notice too much in the end of the day, but they still advance. If you had a bit of advice for other filmmakers out there wanting to do creatures in their pieces, mm -hmm. what kind of advice would you give them? Comes to Weta Digital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I mentioned at the beginning, take your time, explore the character, think about what character you want to have and what role does this character play in your movie. Don't neglect it as for like being a monster and a beast and you know visual effects will do it for you. In the end of the day, I think it's important to kind of share a bit of a vision of what your character wants to be. So that really was a pivotal point on the Tomorrow War. Well, Sheldon, thank you so much for taking a moment in your morning over in New Zealand to hop online and join us for, for this episode. It was really cool hearing you break down some of the, the approaches you guys took to the creatures of this film. Pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fun talking to you guys. All right. Well, hopefully we'll do it again sometime. Awesome. Thank you, guys. So long, Sheldon. Bye. What's up, guys? My name's Jordan, and I'm here to talk to you about our sponsor, Raycon. I know a lot of other people have been on this couch and talked about Raycons before, but <laughs> let me tell you, I am here to talk about their newest release, the work earbuds. I build things, I get ready for productions, you know? So I just stick these little guys in and I don't have to hear the world around me. I can put on my noise cancellation and just jam out to my music while I'm building tables. So then I go out for a coffee break and that's when I turn on my ambient mode because I don't want to get hit by a semi truck on the way to getting coffee. <laughs> Raycon is co-founded by Ray J and also loved by many celebrities like Snoop Dogg and Mike Tyson. If you need a pair of wireless earbuds to take you from conference calls to your Zoom meetings, Raycon's work earbuds are a game changer. So Raycon now has active noise cancellation for maximum focus and an ambient mode for when you need to hear the world around you. Raycon's wireless earbuds offer a 32 hour battery life, a super comfortable fit and a six microphone system. It cuts down on environmental noise and ensures your voice is crystal clear on your Zoom calls. Raycon offers their wireless earbuds in a range of fun colors and patterns with a variety of fit options and no dangly wires or stems. Not only are they half the price of other premium earbud brands, but Raycon also offers a 45 day free return policy. Look, the work earbuds are for you. Click the link below or go to buyraycon.com slash quarter crew work so you can get 15% off your next Raycon purchase. You're gonna be able to hear everything or nothing if you don't want to. They're literally to die for. Seriously. Ding dong. Hi, it's me. I'm wearing the costume. I'm dressed up like Nico from Visual Effects Artists React. Do you have any tricks or treats for me? And then this is where you go, yes, I have a treat for you. And you give me a subscribe if you're not subscribed. And if you have a trick, well, let us know your favorite VFX trick that we should react to in a future episode. And I won't shoot you with a shotgun. It's okay. <laughs> Ren. Run. That scene is for subscribers on the website only. Oh, yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah, you got subscribed. <laughs> See you guys for the Thanksgiving VFX React special. Thanksgiving! We, react to the Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. That's <laughs> we will watch Bone Tomahawk then. <laughs> the pilgrims! Yo, there's horror movies, there's Halloween movies, there's Christmas movies. Where's the love for Thanksgiving movies? Come on. No, okay. No. Right. no. <laughs> no. I don't give thanks for Thanksgiving movies. Mm. Ref. Yep.